So now that we have complex numbers, we can now represent voltages as sine and cosine. Again, when you have sine waves, they have both terms, a sine wave and a cosine wave. With a complex number, I can represent both with the real part and complex part. The objective here is to represent a sine wave with a single number, albeit that number will be complex. Also want to express a sine wave that you see on an oscilloscope, like the waveform here, express those as a complex number. And also, if this is a filter, where x is the input, y is the output, express the gain of that filter also as a complex number. Now, for voltages, a generic sine wave has both a real part and a complex part as a cosine and a sine term. If you prefer, prefer polar form, I can also write it, write it as an amplitude and a phase shift, where omega is the frequency. Note that to represent a sine wave, I need two terms, either the cosine and sine term, or the amplitude and angle. Complex numbers let you do that. The complex number representation of a sine wave is called the spacer representation. Now the heart of complex numbers is Euler's identity. If I have e to the j omega t, that's a vector that spins around the unit circle counterclockwise. The real part maps out cosine, and the complex maps out sine. So what we do when you have a sine wave is change the problem. If you have a problem that's hard to solve, change it. But change it in a way that's easy to solve, although you keep the flavor of the problem. If my input is a cosine, what I'll do is I'll pretend the input is a complex exponential. If I take the real part, I'll get the cosine. Likewise, the number 1, 1 times e to the j omega t, means 1 times cosine. If I want to represent both sine and cosine, what I do is take my complex exponential, multiply by a plus jb. Doing some algebra, what you wind up with is the real part of a plus jb times the complex exponential is a cosine omega t minus b sine omega t. That's the phase of representation for sine wave. The real part means cosine, minus j means sine. If you prefer polar form, you can also represent complex numbers. If I have a complex number r at angle theta, what that means is r times e to the j theta. If that's multiplied by the complex exponential, doing some algebra, what you wind up with is the real part is r cosine theta omega t, or r cosine omega t plus theta. So r at angle theta means r cosine omega t plus theta. The omega t is understood. If I have a circuit where the input is 60 hertz, everything is 60 hertz, so you don't have to write that down. What I care about is the amplitude and the angle. Those are the things that will vary in the circuit. And we've got two domains. We've got the phasor domain and time domain. Time domain is what we're used to. It's how you represent sine waves as, say, 3 cosine 20t plus 8 sine 20t. The 20 is the frequency in radians per second. To represent this in phasor domain, what I do is the real part means cosine minus j means sine. So 3 cosine plus 8 sine as the phasor representation, 3 minus j8. Real is cosine minus j is sine. If you prefer polar coordinates, the time function 8 cosine 20t minus 23 degrees is represented as 8 at angle minus 23 degrees. With that, I can now add and subtract sine waves. The frequency has to be the same for them, them to add. If the frequency is the same, I can now add, say, v1 plus v2. In the time domain, I would just say, take the cosines, add them together. 2 plus 3 is 5. Take the sine waves, add them together. 8 minus 6 is 2. In the phasor domain, I would take the phasor representation, 3 minus j8. Again, real is cosine, minus j is sine. Plus 2 plus j6. Add the complex numbers together. I get 5 minus j2. The phasor representation of the answer. Uh, note the complex numbers is a little bit easier to use. Uh, it also works in polar form. In polar form, I would add 7 at minus 15 degrees, plus 9 at 67 degrees, add them together, you get a complex number. To illustrate, let's use an HP calculator. To input the number 7 at 15 degrees, I'll go to polar mode. I'll now enter 7, enter 15, enter 7 at 15 degrees, add to it 9 at 67 degrees, 9, enter 67. 
and I'll add. There's your answer. If I want to go back to rectangular form, voila. So I can add, subtract uh, phasor voltages. In the lab, if I apply a sine wave to a circuit and measure it on the oscilloscope, what I'll get are traces like this, where the x-axis is time, the y-axis is voltage. What I want to do is represent these phasors, these voltages, as a phasor. To do that, I need three parameters. I need the frequency, the amplitude, and the angle. The frequency is 1 over the period. Sine waves are periodic. The period is the time between when it repeats. See the distance between zero crossings, or distance between the minimums or the maximums, it's all the same. Here the period is 400 milliseconds. The frequency is 1 over the period. It's one cycle every 400 milliseconds, or 2.5 hertz. The natural frequency is radians per second. The natural frequency is 2 pi times frequency, 2 pi f. So the actual frequency is 5 pi radians per second. That's the natural frequency. The peak voltage is, fairly obviously, just the amplitude of the peak. Here y, the red line, is 22 volts peak. The blue line is 14 volts peak. The phase shift is a little bit trickier. One cycle is 360 degrees. A cosine is a peak at t equals 0. Here at the x waveform, the peak is 80 milliseconds after t equals 0. So the phase shift is 80 milliseconds, that percentage of a period, when period is 360 degrees with a negative sign, time delay is negative. So x has a phase shift of minus 72 degrees. y has a delay of 170 degrees to the peak, for 170 milliseconds, corresponding to this percentage of 360, minus 153 degrees. So the phasor representation of x and y is the amplitude at the angle, 14 at minus 72 degrees, that's the blue waveform. The y waveform is phasor representation is 22 at minus 153 degrees. Note in lab, you get polar coordinates. There's also a rectangular equivalent, either one's correct. It's a little bit easier to see polar form in lab, however. To find the gain of a circuit, a very typical problem we have is that if a circuit, I have a sine wave in, I measure the sine wave out. From those two, tell me what the gain of the circuit is. And there's a couple of variations. I can say, given the input and the circuit, what's the output? Given the input and the output, what's the gain? Or, given the output and the gain, what was the input? Any of those work? These will be complex numbers, so likewise we'll be multiplying or dividing complex numbers to get the parameter that we want. Here we want the gain. So the gain is just output over input. When you divide complex numbers, the amplitudes divide and the angles subtract. We'll use that to say here, the gain is just the ratio. Output over input, 22 over 14. That's the gain, the amplitude. The phase shift is the difference in delays. Take the difference between the two zero crossings, y lags x by 90 milliseconds. Converting to angle, 90 milliseconds is that percentage of the period, minus 81 degrees. So this filter has a gain of 1.5 and minus 81 degrees. So with that, I can now represent voltages as a phasor. Again, the amplitude is the amplitude, angle is the delay. We're now going to look at how to represent impedances, resistors, inductors, capacitors, as a complex number.